welcome to Canonical, the podcast that takes literature out of the classroom. I'm James Xiao, and with me are my co-hosts, Sam Spieler and Iad Darris. Good evening. Hey. Hello. Today we are continuing our discussion of Herta Mueller's The Passport, the first book in our series Life Under Communism. Today's discussion may contain spoilers. If you haven't read the book yet, we previously posted a spoiler-free review episode last week. If you'd like to chat with us, you can find us on social media and on Reddit at Canonical Pod. All right, Sam, so you're going to explain to us why Germans became Nazis, is that right? Yeah, I would like to explore today a concept that I'm only a little familiar with, but when has that stopped me before? There is a concept in German that is not possible to perfectly translate into English called Heimat. Uh, the word Heim translates to home, which is easy enough. But Heimat does not have a single definition. Uh, there are some Germans that have described Heimat like a village, uh, a place where a person feels safe, surrounded by the trustworthy and familiar, both in terms of place and society. Others have focused on its idyllic nature or identity, maybe akin to a homogenous country village life. Semantically, Heim is more of an individual house or homestead, while Heimat could be a broader homeland or patria or fatherland. So as you may already suspect, this took on some problematic extra weight in the first half of the 1900s, being coupled with German romanticism and nationalism, as well as patriotism based on regional identity, uh, which then became easy fodder for the fascist blood and soil literature of the Nazis, focusing on the home of one's father, coming before all else, as well as suspicion and outright hatred of the other, the foreign, and anything different from ancestral lineage. So Mueller wrote an essay in 2003 called, in English, The King Bows and Kills. It hasn't been translated into English, so my understanding of it is largely based on others' accounts. But in it, she makes a distinction between the smaller village Heimat, or Dorf Heimat, and the broader nation-state Heimat, or Staatsheimat. She says, village home as Germanism, and state home as uncritical obedience and blind fear of repression, as part of that distinction. That essay criticizes both, however, with the German village's 300-year-old patriotism based on the ethnocentric patriarchal myth of superiority, as well as the nationalist patronizing politics of this era that kept Romania trapped in this victim victimizer mindset of cruelty, corruption, and hypocrisy. Since it's a German, we haven't read this essay, but I don't think we need to in order to see Mueller's feelings on this subject. Do we see evidence of that stance in the passport? I think what we see that's interesting to me is how these two different understandings of home work well when they are laid on top of each other. When you have the village home and the nation home, they don't conflict with each other. But when the nation home is a foreign country, Romania, then you might tend to lean in more heavily onto the village home. You lean into the Germanness because it becomes in opposition to the nation home, which demands a different type of obedience that you might not be willing to comply with. Interesting. I'm not sure I agree. I agree in theory. I don't think you're wrong, but I don't know that that's exactly the problem that we see here. I think they are rubbing against each other, but I don't know if Romania specifically is the problem. I think this Romania, Ceausescu, is the problem. These were problems that were present in Germany as well. So to clarify, when she's using Staatsheimat, is she talking about just the German state? Or is she also talking about the Romanian state? Or is she only talking about the Romanian state? Because it sounds to me like from what Iad is saying is that Iad's understanding it as the German state and the German village. No, I think she is talking about Romania. I think he's right that there is this rubbing up against German ideals from the village standpoint and the Romanian state. But the way you phrased it, yeah, it, I took your meaning to be like Romanian ideals. And I don't think these are Romanian ideals. 
I think my understanding of Heimat is it's not something that exists specifically for Germans to Germany, but the relationship of any person to his home country. And what makes it difficult in this novel is they have a German village, but their country is not a German country. And that disconnect between village and country pushes them closer, I would say, to the Germanness of their village because it's in conflict with the Romanianness of their country. Whereas if you are in Germany itself, you don't seek out to amplify your Germanness because there's nothing for that Germanness to stand in relief to. Yeah, I think you're right. But that seems to suggest that the village home is somehow better. Whereas I think she's saying, no, they're both bad. They're both very problematic. I think it encourages a kind of conservatism that she would probably be opposed to. And I think living, we can't call it exile, but living abroad, it encourages a kind of groupthink that I think she would also be opposed to. I even feel this myself as an American living in China. I have more nostalgia for America now than I ever did in America. And if you asked me to critically analyze American politics, I would say I may be in one way less equipped to do so now because I am longing for my country more than I was before. Can we point to specifics in the text where either they butt up against each other or where we can see her stance are on one or the other or both simultaneously? Or is it more of a generalized feeling? I think it's pretty clear that she, in the book, is criticizing the patriarchy that exists. And you get that with, for example, in the scene where, well, multiple scenes where Windish calls his wife a whore or hints that she's a whore. I think the reader is meant to feel sympathy for the wife. And that seems to be a parallel to the way he treats his wife, that kind of power dynamic. You might see it reflected in other power dynamics in the story, the way the state might treat the individual, for example. I think what she offers us is the opportunity to see a situation where there is no escape. Being German is not an escape from patriarchy. Being German is not an escape from a bad family situation. So it's not a specific point in the text, but rather it's the entire structure of the novel where you have this group of people longing for something else that they think may solve their problems, but it encourages a kind of uh, dramatic irony where I, as a reader, know it's not going to solve their real problems. Does that mean yet that, in your mind, when they go to Germany, it's not going to solve any issues? Is that what you mean? This is something we'll talk about more in the next episode, but I have the impression that no. I think that Mueller is pointing to more deep-seated issues that cannot be resolved with immigration. So this takes place, as we discussed, in a German-speaking village in Romania. Is the German of this book at odds with the Romanian? Or in other words, do you see the Dorfheimat at odds with the Staatsheimat? For example, for me, one of the things that marks the more German village home is this idea of purity and tradition and maybe righteousness. But that gets complicated. First of all, it's at odds with the corruption that's happening, the nation state corruption. But you can't put it all on uh, the Romanian state either, because after all, this is a German village and they are mostly homogenous is the sense I get. And they betray each other and do some pretty terrible things to each other. And I don't think you can blame that all on the authoritarian nature of things. I think the conflict that we see in the novel is actually much more historically informed than we can kind of abstract. Because in World War II, up until 1944, Romania was actually aligned with Nazi Germany. 
So these Germans living in Romania, they're called Swabians, I think, in this area they call it Banat, I guess. They were allies, but in 1944, Romania basically switched teams, and then they immediately became enemies, which I think is a really, really, really tough moment in history to be in. I can't imagine that. But in terms of this idea of Heimat, it shows you the problems of Heimat as this kind of enduring, everlasting thing. This is something that we talked about when we're talking about uh, Abdul Razak Gurna's paradise, the idea of home being a natural thing. These people are in Romania because of a fact of history. They emigrated there, and now because of a fact of history, they are no longer welcome people. So their existence in this land is very contingent rather than something natural and everlasting. Sam, can you define Dorfheimat again? That's the village home. So it's this idyllic sense of village life, and it's tied together with tradition and patriarchal society. It sounds very insular to me. It sounds very... Everyone is of the same stock, so to speak. I think when people speak positively about it, it sounds like they focus on everyone being of the same Germanic or at the very least similar ancestral lineages. I think it's very difficult for Americans to understand this because this idea is very antithetical to the American experience. I'm asking because I tried to look it up and I just couldn't find a definition for it. I don't know how you found the definition for this, like if it was in the context of an essay. The problem that we might be having with this is the problem with the language, because German is a building language where they... It adds words together, yeah. Yeah, so that might be her definition. Heimat is something that exists, but maybe Dorfheimat is... I don't know if she created it, but at least for the purposes of this essay, it sounds like she defined those two things. That is my guess. So no, I didn't look up those terms independently. I kind of understand it in a sort of like Santa's village kind of way. Like that's kind of how I understood Dwarfheimat with the dwarfs. Um, But also in terms of like a harmonious village, you know, where everyone's kind of doing something together. But I don't know if that's the correct understanding because I didn't see that essay. I think that's correct, but I think this book complicates that because it's not idyllic. Like I said before, I don't think it's complicated only because of the fact that they are in Romania and that, as he had said, they're suddenly in a land that does not recognize them as friend. Uh, I think it's much more than that. I think they are turning on each other and... Where once maybe you could look at this village and say this is a village that works together in a harmonious way, it sounds like that hasn't been true for quite some time, and that they're very willing to sell each other out in order to survive or escape. I think that's the question, though, right? You're saying it hasn't worked for some time, but perhaps the more critical stance is it actually never worked. I think that's what she might be getting at, that if it is this shaky in this circumstance, How can we trust it even before? But I think she's also pointing to deeper seated issues that, like you said, may have always been there that are just more pronounced in the face of these hardships. The clearest example for me of it not working in that way is the priest taking advantage of these people who need to um, procure their baptismal certificate. Because, I mean, once again, from the American perspective, actually what I visualize is kind of like a Friar Tuck kind of situation. You know, like that's what you think of when you think of the local priest or whatever in a village. And this guy is just, you know, trading in sexual favors. I don't know enough about Dorf Heimat or whatever she um, wants to critique (laughs) just to say if she is actually critiquing it or not. But I think it's pretty clear that it is not present in this book, this kind of um, village ethos. I don't think you have to even look to the priest. I think that is maybe the clearest example. But even the way the father treats his family, well, even the way either of the parents treat each other and their daughter, I think you can see that breakdown of that idyllic nature pretty clearly there. I can see it in the novel. 
when I think about the setting of this novel, when I imagine it in my head, it's much more of like a closed set. Like I'm thinking of a stage play where you have a certain fixed amount of buildings on stage. And there may be things happening in the world, but they're happening off stage. So there is a sense of claustrophobia that I imagine when I read this novel, where the entirety of our concern is this village. And that limiting of our concerns to this village is what brings this Dorfheimat into the novel, because the outside world doesn't seem as real as the village. If I understand it right, I think that's kind of in line with how I read it as well. It works well, I think, with the prose style, because the prose style doesn't allow you to build anything else. There is no world really in the novel. So the only thing you can get is the scraps that form the village. You couldn't imagine anything else inside of this world. I think we do get snippets like Ceausescu is mentioned early on in the novella. He doesn't come up much, but I think we get that sense that that is what is going on outside of this village, that that's all that's going on outside of this village unless you escape Romania completely. There are some references to the West, especially West Germany. I think there's even an allusion to the U.S. at some point. But yeah, I, th I think I have a similar understanding. Well, can I ask you, Sam, uh, what is it about this essay that drew your attention? Like, why are you drawn to Heimat in this lens of looking at the book? I like this complication of these ideas. I think the idea of home has been on my mind lately a lot, uh, what that means. But this is a very, very different definition of home, a much more specific definition of home that you know I can't speak to like we've discussed already this is very different from anything you might find in the US and yet I think there are parallels to the sort of xenophobia that creeps in um I don't think that is overt here but there definitely are breaks in the armor that is the the Dorfheimat and I think those kinds of breaks in that armor are the kinds of things that we deal with in terms of trying to find an accord with neighbors who are different or the same. I think you could find a parallel. You could find one way to make this work in an American context if you imagined some undocumented Mexicans living in a community in America and you know, often their communities are full of people who are also Mexican, Latino people. They speak Spanish with each other, but they are separated from the wider American context. They have this kind of idyllic situation. They may have this Dorfheimat that Mueller would talk about, but it's in conflict with the values of the wider American state. Yeah, I didn't really consider that, but I think that's true. So at the end of the novel, all three main characters do finally leave, but they return the following year. How do you interpret that ending, both their escape and their return? How do the, the way you interpret that leaving and returning to fit with or complicate this idea of Heimat? I think one thing that I notice when they return the wife, Katharina, says, it's as if we never lived here. And I think what that points to is the fact that the character of a place being home, it's much more to do with you than it is with the place itself. So once you shift yourself out of that context, returning to the context, it brings you a sense of the uncanny. You're in a place that you feel should have this resonance with you, but it doesn't. And that absence is uncanny. It's unsettling, actually. The part that stands out for me in the last section is uh, Mueller seems to draw attention to her heels. It's a marker of how she is different from the other people who are living in that village. Because as she's walking, it's clicking on the cobblestones or whatever, and then um, I think it's mentioned like two or three or maybe even four times in that section. This is on page 90 in my copy. 
Windish's wife is wearing black shoes with high heels. It seems to me like the heels stand out because you get the sense that she was quite poor before. And now she's wearing heels. Like for me as a non-Romanian, like I feel like that's a class distinction that she's not from there anymore. Yeah, it doesn't seem to fit with the village aesthetic. Yeah. Well, in the car, too. They show up in a car. Uh, where did this car come from? That seems pretty ritzy. I guess, for me, when I read this ending, it kind of seemed like their life did improve. At least materially, it improved. Spiritually, it's much less clear, because it does end in the church. So that's my question to you, I guess, is... How do you understand the spiritual change in this return? Is it the same? Because that's maybe the best um, conclusion I arrived at, which is that it seems like even though materially they've changed, spiritually they seem much the same. Yeah, one of the things that I was struggling with was why do they even want to return? Like, I know that this was their home for quite some time, but it really seems like they were miserable toward the end, especially right up at the end. But I think it's worth noting that only two of them return. Amelie is not in that last section. And I think that helps me understand the parents a little bit more in that they seem to be able to compartmentalize those feelings a little bit more. I don't read this as a permanent return, though. Is that how you read it? I read it as like a just a trip back to their old village. Right. I did too. It's not surprising, though. I mean, it seems like something human beings would do. Yeah, places can be unpleasant, but just the fact that you were there creates some affection, right? I suppose, but I think it also shows to me the struggle that the two that return went through versus the struggle of the one who did not return. Again, I think we're going to talk about Amelie a lot more in the next episode, but I'll say that I think Amelie goes through things much more viscerally than anyone else to the point that her parents, one of them more or less pimps her out and at least is conflicted about it, but still does it. And the other doesn't seem to care. Pimping is not the word that I would use. Yeah. I know what you're getting at, but I think that pimping has an additional meaning. Right. Okay. He treats her as a commodity, a sexual commodity. It's something to be bartered with. See, I wouldn't even say he treats her as such, but that he is forced to reckon with her as a sexual commodity. I know it seems like we're talking semantics here, but I don't think he wants her to be a sexual commodity, but he has to let her do it. Yeah, I agree. Sam's wrong. Let her do it? See, that? I think this is an important distinction. Well, he tried to give the guy bags of flour, and the guy wouldn't take his bag of flour, so... But those are different people. I think that's a separate issue. There is a point in the novel where he says, quite flatly, he says, you know, he can have the flour, but he can't have my daughter. Yeah, I thought it was the same. It was because he talks to the postwoman, and the postwoman tells him something like, those two bags of flour are not enough. Like, you have to give more. Like, I think he tried to pay <laughs> with flour. And then he is forced to reckon with the idea that the guy's going for a different kind of thing. And after it happens, they have mass and he refuses to go to mass because he knows when he goes, everyone will be talking about him and his daughter. But I, I had a problem with your use of the word let, which made it seem like this was something she wanted rather than something that she was forced to do. He, he stopped preventing it from happening. I don't think it's clear. Like, I don't think she is necessarily against it. Like, it's a rape. Ooh, because I, I think oh, that... I very much disagree. I think the scene where it happens and the scene right after tell me that this is not something she wanted. Well, it's not something she wanted. She is less opposed to it. I think that... She doesn't like it, but by showing us the scene with her and her boyfriend, what's his name, Detlef or Dieter or something? It's crude to say so, but by showing her as a sexual being earlier in the novel, it primes us for the idea that she is open to sexuality later. 
And obviously, it's a different context, obviously. But I think that there is a subtle indication that this is something we're going to talk about in the next episode, but Amelie is more pragmatic when it comes to the way of the world. When she reckons with the sexual exchange, it's not the same way that Windish does. That's how I understand it as well, because I think Windish comes off as being very prudish, and he doesn't want to think about his daughter as being sexually active. Well, save your spunk for the next episode, because this is coming up. All right. Well, we will have a lot to talk about next week, then. Thank you for listening. You can find us on Reddit or on social media at CanonicalPod. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a nice review on Apple or whatever you use to listen to podcasts. We'll be back next week with more discussion. Till then, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.